Thanks to Plex for sponsoring a portion of this video. What's up everybody? Uh, so today is Friday as I'm recording this section of the video and honestly, I cannot think of a better way to kick off this particular weekend than by unboxing and setting up this massive beast. This, my friends, is the Sony X95L. And I gotta tell you, I'm extremely excited to check out this TV. First thing I wanna mention is this TV is extremely heavy. It's definitely the heaviest TV that I've ever had here, um, except maybe, maybe that 97 inch OLED that we got, but it's close. You might be setting this up yourself and you're gonna definitely need a friend uh, in order to do that, but um, also because I'm kind of encouraged by its weight. Um, I know that we all like super thin, uh, lightweight TVs and everything, but Something like this, the weight kind of speaks to the quality of the TV, I think. It's Sony's most, I don't know, ambitious mini LED TV yet. Uh, I don't feel like we've seen anything quite like this since uh, the 8K mini LEDs that, that Sony put out uh, before, which as a reminder, this is not an 8K TV, this is a 4K TV, which I am just fine with. There's your remote right there. Um, and yeah. Uh, you know how Sony does these days. There are going to be a lot of these plastic covers to put on the back of the TV. I usually don't though, because it's just like, I'm always back there in and out. I don't know, we'll see. Let's worry about that a little bit later. We've got to get this box off this TV. And because it is so heavy, we're going to have to do that off camera because I'm going to need Zeke's help. We've got the top of the box off, uh, more plastic pieces. The other thing I've learned since we got the top of the box off is that this TV is backward uh, for what we need to do for setup here. So if you learn nothing else from this video, pay attention to which is the front of the TV uh, if you're gonna assemble it the way we're gonna do. You all right? Okay. Okay, so per the usual, we have a couple of different uh, mounting options here. One, we can go towards the center with a narrower stance. That's better if you have a smaller entertainment stand. Uh, we have a nice wide one. Uh, the BDI Elements is plenty big enough for this. So we're gonna go with the far uh, edges of the TV for the leg mounting location. And then in terms of the position of the legs, we have two options here. If we go with the higher of the two, um, we can lock that in a couple of screws and we've got the flush mount, so this TV is gonna sit right down on the stand, or we can move them down one space, which is I think what we're gonna do today. So even though I do like that low profile, sort of low slung look, we're gonna go with this particular mounting location. But while we're down here, um, maybe check out the speaker system. This is a pretty expensive TV. You'd hope the onboard audio would be decent. Looks like we've got some two and a half to three inch drivers on either side of the TV with some base ports here. So, um, you know, Sony does a good job with making good sounding TVs. I'm hoping that's the case here. Yeah, that is uh, indeed a heavy TV. Um, but you know what? Not too much trouble getting it up. We'll pull off the uh, plastic here for a bit of a reveal. Yeah, no protective film on the screen, which you know, I enjoy peeling that stuff off. I am noticing that the anti-glare looks fairly effective here. Uh, I'm gonna try and get this on camera. With the studio lights, you can see the, the light kind of being scattered across the screen, and there are almost these like vertical bars of red and blue. It's not the rainbow effect that we saw on Samsung TVs. Uh, we'll have to see how it fares in real, real life use. Okay, we're up and running and we're really testing the edges of the media console. This TV has a very wide stance. Now we need to get set up with Google TV and that's just the basic Google TV setup. You use the Google Home app to run through all this stuff. The only thing worth noting is that one, you get an opportunity to select power saving mode, either off, low or high. I'm going off because I want maximum brightness out of this TV. And then it's also gonna do an audio calibration uh, partway through the setup. You can skip this if you want to, but I've had pretty good results with this. So I suggest going ahead with that. And once all the downloads and updates are completed, we are off to the races and we can start watching TV and dialing in our picture presets. All right, right off the bat, fully unscripted, first impressions. 
I like what I'm seeing. But I get to spend the whole weekend with this TV, then we'll get into doing some measurements, and then I'll be ready to give you the full review. Now, we're going to do it right now. And folks, this is a question I wasn't gonna ask rhetorically or otherwise, but I feel like I have to in order to get into this review. Could this actually be the best LCD TV I've ever reviewed? Well, I'm not gonna hold you. I refuse to bury the lead on this one, so I'm just gonna come right out and say it. The Sony X95L is the best LCD TV I have ever tested. That is not hyperbole. This is it. This is the one. This is the way, as the Mandalorian would say, and that's a foreshadowing of something we'll see later. But, and it's really important to me that you hear this, just because I say this is the best LCD TV I've ever tested does not mean that it is necessarily the best TV for you to buy, even if cost is no object. The how, the why, and the what behind that claim are vital to understanding whether or not the X95L might be the best TV for your needs. So going forward, I'm gonna go through a quick mini LED primer, and then we're gonna talk about the balancing act that is TV design and engineering, and how Sony likes to perform that balancing act. We'll get into the measurements a bit. I'll do a little bit of contrasting this TV against others, pun 100% intended there. And then I'll see what I can do to put a nice little bow on this package. Sound good? Sweet, let's do it. Starting with that mini LED primer, which you can skip if you think you know everything there is to know about mini LED TVs, though what I'm about to say might surprise you. All LCD TVs require a backlight. First, it was cold cathode fluorescent bulbs. Then we went to LEDs, at which point we stopped calling these LCD TVs and just LED TVs for short. Now we're up to mini LED. Mini LEDs are, as you might expect, much smaller than regular LED backlights. That means we can cram way more of them in the same amount of space, and that also means they can be broken down into more and smaller local dimming zones, where the mini LEDs can be brightened and dimmed according to what's happening on the screen. That's a desirable point of technology because in theory, the more local dimming zones you have, the more control you would have over the contrast on the screen and the less blooming you would have around bright objects on dark backgrounds. However, as we've recently learned, just because a TV has mini LED backlighting doesn't mean it is necessarily gonna be superior in picture quality to a standard LED TV. The Sony X90L actually is a great example of a TV with a standard LED backlight that outperforms comparably priced mini LED TVs from competing brands. It is also true that having more local dimming zones doesn't necessarily mean the picture quality is automatically going to be better. Again, the Sony X90L is a great example of a TV that has far fewer dimming zones than like price competition, and yet it still looks outstanding. I mention all of that because while the X95L here is a mini LED TV, and it does have a respectable number of dimming zones, it probably does not have as many as, say, the TCL QM8 mini LED TV. And I say probably because Despite trying, I've been unable to count the number of zones on this TV. It's simply too hard for me to do. That brings me nicely to my next point. Having a ton of dimming zones is not gonna be a great thing unless you have powerful enough processing to handle all of those zones. Specifically, you need a really good local dimming algorithm to make sure all those zones dim and brighten quickly and precisely. Now, somewhat ironically, if any TV brand has the chops to build a super advanced local dimming algorithm, it's Sony, but that wasn't Sony's goal here. Instead, Sony sought out to strike a balance between contrast, which sure, it's the most noticeable aspect of picture quality, but contrast along with all the other elements of picture quality, balancing all that out. And guys, Sony did it. Now, I'm gonna save most of the comparisons that illustrate this for the X95L versus TCL QM8 video that we'll make next. But the takeaway is that the X95L here does the right amount of the right stuff to yield absolutely superb picture quality. And hey, what a perfect time to tell you about Plex and the Plex Pass subscription. I'm super excited to be working with Plex because I've been a Plex user and Plex Pass subscriber myself for over 10 years now. I started using Plex because I needed one place to organize my movies, TV shows, and music collection. And Plex still does that, but it does so much more. And the Plex Pass unlocks an awesome roster of features 
features that makes enjoying all of your entertainment easy, fun, and beautiful. Did you know that Plex makes it easy to find and discover any and all content across all streaming platforms? Say you want to watch The Righteous Gemstones. Just go to Plex and search for that title and Plex will direct you to the streaming service that's got it. By selecting the streaming services you watch the most, all you have to do is open Plex to see what's popular across all your favorite apps. It even helps you track new episodes. This is how streaming TV should be. And as I mentioned before, you can easily stream your collection from your Plex media server to any of your devices, no matter where you are. When you upgrade to Plex Pass, you can download your content to your devices for enjoyment later, which is clutch for any time you'll be off grid for a while. Enjoy high quality trailers, interviews, and other extras for movies and TV. TV shows in your library automatically curated by Plex. Plex Pass lets you watch and record live TV too, and Plex will let you skip intros and credits on your content as well. Plus all this art and info for your content, Plex handles that automatically, making it a beautiful interface that's a joy to use. The Plex Pass is just five bucks per month, but this week only you can get Plex Pass for life for less than $100. Act now to get this amazing deal by clicking the link down in the description of this video and thank me later, you're gonna love it. Before we get into some show and tell, let's get into the nitty gritty down and dirty in a section I like to call Numbers for Knit Nerds. I'm making a song for that Knit Nerds intro, by the way, and Zeke doesn't know about it, but he's going to record it. Well, actually, Zeke knows now, so surprise, dude. I can't wait. It's going to be fire. Anyway, in this section of the review, we're going to cover some of the measurements I got when testing this TV. You can feel free to skip ahead if this doesn't sound exciting to you using the timestamps down in the description. So to test this TV, I used the custom picture preset, and I recommend anyone who buys this TV to use that picture preset for both SDR and HDR content watching. For Dolby Vision, I usually use Dolby Vision Bright, though in a dark room, Dolby Vision Dark works quite well too. Now in SDR, with the TV's brightness set at the default of 35, I got 520 nits peak from a 10% window. If I bumped the brightness setting up to max, the TV went up to 640 nits, all of which is very respectable for SDR. The white balance and grayscale out of the box was very good with a max delta E of four, just over four, and that was just the brightest whites. Otherwise, the errors were all below three, and that's awesome. Color accuracy was excellent for an uncalibrated TV too with very low errors across the board. Cyan, interestingly, was the only rogue color along with some adjacent colors, but even it wasn't that far out. The story was similar for HDR in the custom picture preset. The white balance was just a bit off with a bit too much red in it, but nothing you could see with your eyes. You need a colorimeter to actually catch it. And HDR colors came in very accurate with most of them being so good that they were barely registered on the testing equipment. After I adjusted the white balance, I noted that peak brightness in SDR dropped just a little bit, but nothing to get riled up about. And in HDR, peak brightness appeared to top out at about 2000 nits. But I wanna talk about how I'm testing HDR peak brightness these days. So historically, when trying to read the peak brightness of a TV, there's a couple of different tests that we would run. One of them is this particular test where we start with a small box and we go to a big box and we see what the peak brightness is for each of those size of boxes. The other is more of a peak luminance stability test where we uh, put one box up there and just let it run and gauge its brightness as it sits there. Now, I can make this box any size that I want, and that'll help get me some kind of a feel for what the peak brightness is depending on the demands on the TV. However, what this kind of testing doesn't allow us to gauge is how peak brightness is handled when there are other elements going on screen. We know that there are some TV manufacturers, I'm not saying Sony does this, but at least some TV manufacturers will game the results knowing that these test patterns are on, the TV will perform a certain way. So now what I and other reviewers are starting to do is use this new peak luminance test pattern on the new Spears and Munsell disc. What it does is it puts a bunch of swirling colors on the screen with what becomes a white circle in the middle. This is gonna be our HDR highlight. And at least for now, the TV's processor doesn't know that this is a test pattern, so it's not gonna gamify the results I'm gonna get. It's gonna give us a real sense for what the peak HDR highlight measurement would actually be when there's actual content on the screen. The brightness level of the overall screen is fluctuating, so we do see a little bit of a fluctuation in the HDR highlight reading, but we can kind of average it out to get a real world result, and that's what I've done here. 
So with that testing methodology, I was seeing between 1300 and 1600 nits for HDR highlights, depending on what was on the screen in that test. I think that's the real world result we can count on. And in HDR, full screen brightness came in at a blistering 800 nits. So there is no doubt this TV is plenty bright for most conditions. After the white balance adjustment, colors were even more accurate across the board and you could get them even better with a full color calibration. And this TV tracked the EOTF curve perfectly. That's the kind of accuracy I expect from Sony. So the measurements tell a very promising story. Not only is the TV going to be more than accurate enough for most folks just right out of the box, no calibration necessary, but if you did hire a calibrator, you can dial this TV into perfection. So with all that out of the way, time to see how the backlight behaves. I think everyone wants to know how's the black levels and the blooming. Well, the black levels are outstanding, which is to say that when they should be pure black, they are, but more importantly, when there's shadow detail to be seen, you can actually see it. Now, when testing this, I originally started with this House of the Dragon episode, which I know Vincent Teo also likes to use, but it's insanely dim content. I wanted to see how the black letterbox bars looked, and honestly, they looked gray. But you can see there's no real blooming in this shot where the bright light at the bottom runs against the letterbox bars just kind of seems to be this static gray. So I switched to a different title, Justice League. Here the black pillar bars are on the left and the right instead of the top and bottom. Same thing, kind of gray. I was beginning to wonder if this might be a problem with the HBO Max, I'm, I'm sorry, Max app, similar to how there seems to be a YouTube app problem on TCL TVs right now. And sure enough, I loaded up Mandalorian on Disney Plus and you can see that not only are the letterbox bars pitch black, but they stay pitch black with the captions turned on, which is a real torture test. So black levels and blooming, awesome news to report there. Likewise, in the bright areas, bright highlights were never blown out, so long as the gradation preferred setting was turned on in the TV. If you choose brightness preferred, you'll get a bright overall picture and even more intense highlights, but you might lose some brightness detail. At least you have that option if you want. I kept testing for blooming and folks, it's just not an issue. What little blooming you can see if you go looking for it is so minimal that it's hardly worth talking about. Now, as you'll see in the X95L versus QM8 video, the blooming here is not as well controlled as it is on the QM8, but that's the kind of thing you only see in a side-by-side -side comparison. And besides, blooming control is not all there is to picture quality. Sony X95L just nails it all. But one area I really want to highlight is off-axis performance. Folks, the X-Wide Angle Tech is just doing a stellar job here. There is so little perceived roll-off to contrast and color saturation as you move off to the side. It's, it's just really impressive. This is one of those video shoots where shooting at an angle was a pleasure because the TV still looks awesome, as you can plainly see here. Now, before I go on, I want to mention that due to some time constraints, I'm gonna have to leave gaming commentary for the Versus video I've been talking about. I can't get into details, but it's the end of the day right now and I had to trim some time, so the gaming portion was it. But I will get into it in the Versus video, so if that is a game-changing factor for you, nope, not gonna apologize for that pun, then be sure to catch that video coming in a week or so. Anyway, folks, this TV is just so good. Like I said, it's the best LCD TV I've ever tested. I really consider that an amazing achievement and I'm inclined to give it a perfect 10 score. Hell, I might even consider getting this over the A95L QD OLED. I don't know, that's gonna take some deep thought, but the fact that it's a candidate at all really says something about this TV. But having said all of that, as I said earlier, all that praise doesn't mean it's the right TV for you. For one thing, the X95L only comes in 85 inches here in North America, and it is very expensive. The street price right now is north of $4,500. The other thing I have to mention is that outside of the North American market, where you can get smaller sizes of the X95L, those smaller sizes don't use the same panel as the 85 inch, and thus the performance is not quite as premium, though I would imagine they're also very good TVs. So, it's hard for me to say that universally the X95L is the best LCD TV you can buy. But also, that premium Sony is charging 
while it does get you the best TV in this 85 inch size here in the North American market anyway, there are other TVs that get very close for less. So if you're thinking 85 inches is too big or that $4,500 is just too much, well, fortunately there are good options out there for less. But if you want the highest level of accuracy and adherence to creator intent, if you want a natural, vibrant, rich, and just well-balanced picture, the X95L is the ticket. I mean, there's not much more I can say after repeating that it's the best LCD TV I've ever tested. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. Thanks as always for watching everyone. What are your thoughts on this TV? You eager to get one? How do you think it's gonna do in the big TV shootout coming up? Let me know down in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you on the next one. And until then, here's two other videos I think you might like.